man. Some people only care about themselves. No one cares about your stupid vacation. Some people treat others poorly. Do it have anarchy. Times, right? There's no. certain things that are right and there's certain that things that are sense. wrong. No. So don't believe what all are this foolishness. Everybody Some people only care about the being right. There are we are one. We are one. We are one. Some people don't seem worth the time. But the truth is. Most people are just working to get by. Most people are terrified to reveal their scars. Most people are fighting an invisible battle. Most people are worth the effort because all people are created in the image of God. Where's my pillow? All people carry the glow of the divine. All people matter enough for God to become one of them. God thinks every person is worthy of love. Imagine if we did too. Let's be a church where everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything is possible. Well, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and pull out this little blue sheet out of your notes in your bulletin today, or you can go to the Version app on your smartphone, Y-O-U version app, click on events, follow along with what we're talking about today. Today we'll be in a couple passages, one in Exodus and one in the book or the letter of Hebrews. We're continuing in our series that we're calling The Way We Worship. And very simply, here's what we've been doing. We've been looking at a tension that I shared with you that my, in my life, and I perceive it in your life, it surrounds this need of God. And very simply put, very, very often we do not see our need for God. We don't see our need for the worship of God. And so here we go. As we move into week four on this, I'm going to let you into a little bit more of what I'm dealing with, of what I'm wrestling with. And actually, Jared and I, every now and then we talk about it, and as we look out at simply the way we worship, as we look at, you know, all this time, all this energy that we put into Sunday morning, to be honest with you, with you we look at each other and we say, uh, what are we doing? What in the world are we doing? Do you, ever, do you ever do that with your job? I'm sure, you know, if you're a teacher, you know, you get to mid-year and you're like, am I, am, are the kids really learning anything? As you go through that daily grind at the plant, you know, okay, i got to provide for my family, but really, am I accomplishing anything? And just so you know, if I'm honest, we have those thoughts around here too. Because we look back, and if you look at the early church, if you study through church history, we begin to wonder, you know, are we, are we getting this right, you know? What we do here on Sunday morning in worship, is it as important as we really think it is? So from music we have, we have coffee bars, we got all kinds of great stuff happening with the kids out there, all this ministry stuff. You have to put, you know, how many hours have you listened to me, right? Is all of that worth it? And those thoughts, that can be a real bummer as a pastor. We begin questioning these things. So needless to say, if this message series you know, maybe it's not encouraging to you at all. It's very encouraging for me, especially as I studied for today's message. Because hear me around this. If, if you're new to this series, I'm not saying that just the worship of God happens right here in this little box on Sunday morning. And we're going to talk about what personal worship means in a couple of weeks. But let me say this. Worshiping God, while it may not be just worshiping Him on Sunday morning, it could be any day of the week, 
when we get together to do this, when there's a group of believers that come together for the purpose of worship, let me just say it, it's a really big deal. And when you begin to look at what worship looks like in your Bibles, let me just say this, it's a huge deal. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can read your Bibles for yourself. So I'm going to just jump to my conclusion right away this morning. In all the ways that in your life and my life we can worship God, in all of those variety of ways that we can do it, God simply says it's just way better when we're together. It just is. Something happens when we worship together. Now, I get it. There's all kinds of different ways we can do that, different styles, different liturgy, different order of how we do it. And a lot of that, like we said last week, remember, it's based on culture or personality or your traditions. But that doesn't change one simple fact. The biblical example, and dare I say, the biblical mandate of worship, when we worship God, it's just better together. Now, as I thought of that, I know some of you would argue with me because I've, I've, I've heard it. Somebody would argue, oh, Pastor John, you just don't know. When I'm out in nature, when I'm just in my deer stand, I feel so much closer to God. Or someone else might say, you know, uh, there's these personal moments in the morning. I have my coffee, it's just me and Jesus, and we're alone. I just feel so close. And I, I, I get that, and I'm not going to disagree with you. But if that's the only way you worship, if you never end up worshiping with others in any other space in your life, you will end up weird. You will just end up plain goofy. Because if I'm left to just my own thoughts and my own heart and my own person, you know what happens over time? Jesus slowly begins to just look like me. Because everything I pray, Jesus agrees with, right? And everything I say, Jesus is agreeing with. And so I would disagree with you on that. Not just because I want to keep my job, but because the Bible is very clear. Here we go. Look in your notes. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but let's encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So you would expect, right, you would expect from a pastor to say, hey, you need to be in church on Sunday morning to worship. I get that. But today I want to give you the reasons why. And the reasons why are not guilt, the reasons why are not fear, but out of a clear need that I believe you and I have in our lives. So as we look at this whole topic of the way we worship, I want you to ask the question, why is worship, the worship of God, better when we're together? Here we go, number one, write it down, are you ready? First answer, because we get to experience more of God's presence. Now, I want to be careful on this. I'm not saying you can't experience God's presence when you're by yourself or that God only shows up on Sunday morning. No, God is real. He can show up anytime, any place in your life. But I'm talking about the presence of God, meaning that when we get together, we get to experience more of God in a variety of more ways than when you're just by yourself. And we see this throughout the entire Bible. The very real presence of God showing up when his people are gathered in worship. So much so that the felt experience of God's presence, where they felt it, they believed it, they sensed it, it was actually a necessity for their very existence. So let me tell you a story around this, right? Most of you know, right, the story of Exodus, Moses leading the people out of Egypt. This was done with great miracles. There's plagues in the Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, God provided them bread, you know, in the morning, the dew on the ground turned into manna, God's presence was very visible. God led them by a pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day, and you also remember how the story goes. You know, Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law of God, to receive the Ten Commandments from God, and what happened when Moses was up there? The people forgot about God, they forgot all the miracles, they forgot about his presence, and what did they do? They create this golden calf. They start worshiping it. Needless to say, God was angered by this. Needless to say, Moses himself was ticked off. So much so that later on, if you, you keep going down that, that story, God tells Moses this. Go ahead. Tell the people, go to the promised land, but my presence is not going with them. And later on, a few verses later, God says to Moses personally, I'm not going to go with the people, but I'll go with you. Just you. That's what God tells him. 
And after that, we encounter one of the greatest, I believe, leadership verses that we see in the Bible. We see Moses' passion for his people, his compassion for his people, even after their rebellion. Moses then, in his conversation and prayer to God, begins to plead with God for the people, begins to intercede with them, and basically saying this, Almighty God, we, all of us, not just me, we need your presence. God, this people will not be able to exist without your presence. Look with me, Exodus chapter 33, here it is, verse 15. Then Moses said to God, God, if you don't personally go with us, don't let us leave this place. We're not going to leave it. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me? How will anyone know you look favorably on your people? If you don't go with us, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from any other people on the earth. So God, if you don't go with us, don't make us go. We are not going to leave. We don't want to leave here unless you go with us. What if we lived our lives with that conviction? God, we don't want to do anything. We don't want to gather around anything unless we know your presence is with us, unless we can experience that. And some might say, well, yeah, if we had a, if we had a pillar of fire at night over Hope Church, you know, or if we all gathered together and this cloud just kind of came in, that, yes, then we would know God's presence. No, you wouldn't. People of Israel experienced all that stuff. They had it all. They had all the miraculous signs. All the miraculous signs showed up, and it didn't work. They still did not see their personal need for God. They needed what Moses had. They needed a heart saying, God, I know it. I know your presence. I just need it. Just you, God. Not all the stuff, just you. And really, that's what we've been talking about, haven't we? You know, in the song we sang, do we see our need for God? Lord, I need you. God, if you don't go with me, whatever we do around here at church, whatever I do with my family, whatever's going on that I'm trying to do in the community, God, if you don't go with me. And here Moses says, if you don't go with we. So take that, fast forward to the New Testament. The people, Jesus' disciples, they've hung out with them. They were with him. They witnessed everything he did. They heard everything he taught. They saw all the miracles. Then they watched Jesus ascend to heaven. But he promised them something before he left. What did he promise? It was the promise of the Holy Spirit. It was the promise that his presence, they would continue to experience it within them, that God would give them the power to experience his presence on a daily basis. And and here's what I want us to see. When God then gave them the Holy Spirit so they could experience his presence, right after Jesus ascended, God could have, but he didn't. He just didn't target each individual disciple where they were. Like, you know, one was out fishing. Oh, now you get the Holy Spirit. One was praying early in the morning on their knees. Okay, now you get the Holy Spirit. It wasn't this spattering of things that happened in individual lives, but look what happened. Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers, not some, all the believers were gathered together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present, so everyone that had gathered together, was filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other languages, they began to speak in tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, I'm not saying you can't experience the Holy Spirit when you are alone, but I want you to see what we would say is normal, or the word that we would use is called normative that you see in the New Testament. It was normative that when the people gathered together to seek God earnestly, something happened. God's presence showed up in a powerful way. And, and, and perhaps as, as you look through the New Testament, as you see that, you realize that is just a snapshot. So we have Old Testament, we see it happening, we see it in the New Testament, and then we're going to see it at the end. And look how it's described, it's just this picture, it's this vision that's described in Revelation 19. Then I heard again what sounded like a shout of a vast crowd. How many people are in a vast crowd? Two or three? Many. And it was like a roar of a mighty ocean. Have you ever been to the ocean and the waves come crashing in? And a crash of loud thunder. 
praise, this is all the voices. They sounded like an ocean. They sounded like a thunder. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us, let us, not let one, let us be glad. Let us rejoice. Let us give honor to him. So all of God's creatures and creation, people and angels alike are gathered together and they're experiencing his presence together. Here's my question for us. Do we come to worship with that expectation? Do we, do we want, do we come in here, whenever we gather together, God, I want to experience your presence. And from time to time, you might have experienced it here or there. You can maybe recall that. Maybe, maybe it was a special worship service here. Maybe it was a conference that you were at when you were younger or maybe a, a worship concert of some kind or during a special music. You, you felt very tangible. It was real, the presence of God when, when you gather together, as you worship together. I, I can remember an event in my life. It was actually a summer camp. And I don't know why, I, 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 except maybe to say that the teenagers that had gathered at that particular camp at that particular time were earnest in their seeking of God. That's all, that's the only, as I thought, think about it, it's the only thing I could think of. But we came and we had the expectation that God would show up. And you know what? He did. In very an experiential way, incredible ways, ways that we could sense it and we could feel it. And we were just a bunch of kids wanting to worship God. But we came expecting that God would show up. And I'm not talking about something that can be manipulated or contrived, like, you know, we're going to sing the same song a dozen times and hope somebody comes forward, you know. But rather from the heart of God's people that says, God, we are not going to do anything. We're not going to go anywhere unless your presence. Lord, we need you. See, it has to start with an expectation. This is why we come together. Something's going to happen. And, and the beauty of my job is I get to hear about this. So sometimes we hear back from some of you who say, you know, I, I don't know why, but during the worship I was just crying today, and I don't know why. Sometimes I see it, you know, when I stand on the door and I, and I greet you on your way out, and some people leave with a, a, a tear-stained face. You know, I'm, I'm hoping their spouse didn't yell at them during church or something, but, you know, God was moving in their heart. And sometimes, to be honest with you, this scares people. They, they, they come to to church and they say, I just cried the whole time. Every time I come, I do that. And then they're scared of that. Sometimes they don't come very often because of that. And I, it's not just about crying, all right? It's some people experience joy, other peace, other a, a warm sense of God's love. Sometimes it happens during a music worship song. Sometimes it happens as we look together in God's word. Sometimes it happens because you have a conversation with somebody and God shows up right out there over a cup of coffee. You can be serving in the kids' wing. Listen, God shows up on the other half of this building. You know that, don't you? You can be ministering to a preschooler, or maybe they just they give you, you ask a question, and then out of a mouth of babe comes a worship of God. They give you a hug, or a grateful mom thanks you, and, and you sense God's presence. And it's not just Sunday morning. It can happen on Tuesday night. It can happen on Wednesday. It can happen in your, we have small group, life group Bible studies, where you get together, someone shares a need, and you say, okay, hey, wait a minute, time out. And, and you gather around that person, you pray, and you just sense the very presence of God. And the one, and it's happened to me a bunch of times, you sense God's presence in such a greater way than if you had just been praying by yourself. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's real. Just this week, I, I, I serve on a board, uh, an advisory board uh, outside of this church, and I went with another leader to another church, and we met with uh, another leadership team over an issue that was going on. And I just want you to know, at the end of that meeting, I just sensed God's presence. It wasn't an emotional moment. There wasn't tears. or <laughs> I just sensed, it was just, these are some of the people that I had never met before. And I just sensed Wow, they love their church. They love Jesus. We're all on the same page here. And I sense God's presence. And all I can say, all I can say to describe it is this. God showed up. Just God showed up. And you and I miss out 
We miss out if we don't build time into our lives to worship together. We miss out experiencing more of his presence. Leads me to number two. Second reason. Why is it better when we're together? Number two, because we're encouraged by God's people. You and I, we encourage by each other. So this week I was reading an article, a New York Times article, and it was written by a doctor. And he was writing on how social, listen now, how social isolation is killing us. And he shared some incredible statistics they found from studying this. And he wrote this just Christmas of 2016, so this is recent. He says, social isolation is a growing epidemic, one that's increasingly recognizing it's having dire physical, mental, and emotional consequences. All right? So since the 1980s, the percentage of American adults who say they are lonely has doubled. It's gone from 20% to 40%. A wave of new research suggests that social separation is bad for us. Individuals with less social connection have disrupted sleep patterns. They have altered immune systems. They have more inflammation. They have higher levels of stress hormones. One recent study found that isolation increases the risk of heart disease by 29% and will increase your risk of stroke by 32%. Being socially isolated. Another analysis, it pulled a bunch of uh, uh, data from 70 studies. So this is looking at 3.4 million people, and they found that the socially isolated person has a 30% higher risk of dying in the next seven years. And it wasn't just old people. That was middle age. And it starts with kids. The study found out that socially isolated children have significantly poor health 20 years later. Look at the case in the news, and I know that's an extreme case. Those kids that were locked away. That's an extreme case. He writes, all told, loneliness is an important risk factor for early death, as obesity and smoking is. That's what he's comparing it to. He writes, the evidence of social isolation is clear. What to do about it, he doesn't know. All right, it's not just middle ages. Another study, all right, another study. Millennials, listen to this. I read another article. It was written, uh, you know, in NPR of Wisconsin. It was written by Katherine Hobson. She wrote this last March. She wrote, she writes, feeling lonely? Too much time on social media may be why. She writes this, for young adults, social media may not be that social after all. Among people in that age group, so they're using heavy platforms of Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram, it was associated, those who use that heavily, it's associated with feelings of social isolation. One of the professors, Brian Primack, writes this, it's social media, so he thinks, aren't people going to be more socially connected? What they found out, and he's from the University of Pittsburgh, what they found out, not so much. So they studied over 1,700 adult a- adults, they're from the age 19 to 32, they ask them about their usage of social media outside of work, and it turns out the people who spent more time on social media, all right, and by more, that's more than two hours a day, they had twice the odds of being lonely and feeling socially isolated than those who spent less than a half hour. So the people that visited frequently, so over 58 times per week, had three times the odds of feeling lonely and being socially isolated. Those that, who, who just viewed it a couple times, fewer than nine times a week. And this study isn't just some blog, all right? This study appeared in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. They quoted another prof from San Diego. What we know at this point is that we have evidence that replacing your real-world relationships with social media is detrimental to your well-being. Because they tracked the use of Facebook over over well-being over time and found that the use of a social media network was negatively associated, negatively, with physical health, mental health, and life satisfaction. Offline interactions, and by the way, I guess that's not how they talk about when you talk to somebody face-to-face. That's, you're having an offline interaction. So we're having an offline interaction right now, just so you know. That's the new word, all right? Offline interactions, meanwhile, had positive effects. Did you hear that? The evidence of social isolation is clear. Then he writes, what to do about it is not clear. I have an answer. Go to church. 
be the church. Hebrews 10.25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Why shouldn't we neglect it? Because you and I need face-to-face encouragement. We need to be uplifted. And I know, I've heard it, people get burned by the church. Oh, no, I, I don't like the people at church. I, it, it's just Jesus and me. It's just Jesus and me. Okay, if, it, you, if you want it to be just Jesus and you, if you want to just grow with you and Jesus, I want you to look at what Paul says. Paul says this, let the message about Christ, about Jesus, in all of its richness fill your life. So you're saying, it's just Jesus and me. I want Jesus to fill my life all the more. How do you get there? Here's how you get there. Teach and counsel each other. It doesn't say teach and counsel yourself. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he's going to give you. Here it is. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. What does that sound like? Coming together and worshiping. If you want to be filled with Christ in your life. The richness of Christ happens when we counsel one another. And the word there is instruct or admonish one another. And and even around the music thing, it's so easy today to just kind of plug and play, whatever you want. And that's great. Have your personal worship time. But something happens when we're together, when we observe one another worshiping. Something happens, parents, when your kids are watching you worship. And I'm not just talking Sunday morning either. The church did more of things than just worship, than this, what we would call Sunday morning worship together. Look, when the early church started, when the Holy Spirit fell on them, look what happened. Acts 2.42, and all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Where do we find the apostles' teaching today? Your Bible. So they devoted themselves to the Bible's teaching and to fellowship. What's fellowship? Hanging out, sharing in meals, eating together, and that included the Lord's Supper and prayer. That's the breakdown. They were together in every one of those things. And yes, we can get together, and you can hear some teaching, and we can get together, and we can sing. But it's really not enough if we're to pay attention to this verse. Because, you know, as the church has grown, we can't always have meals. But you know what? That's why we encourage life groups. We encourage our small group Bible studies together, because that's what they do. You're around the apostles teaching, you're fellowshipping, you're sharing your meals, there's time for you to pray. That's why we get together. And you know what, of all of those things, if I'm, really, if I'm just honest with you in my life group, and all of these things that the Bible commands me to do, are you listening to me? The Bible commands me to do that. You know what my th- favorite thing is? Meal time. It's biblical. Here's the verse. It's in there. And I know some of you life groups, you just have a little dessert. Ah, you're missing out. You're flat out missing out. If you share a meal together, something happens. We let, we let ourselves down when we eat, don't we, a little bit? We get to know each other a little bit more. And it's hard to do when we're a big group. It's easy breezy when you're a small group. It's easy. And some people, oh, it's just too complicated. All right? You know what? If it's too complicated for you to organize meal, meals, call our office, and they will put you in touch with the woman who organizes our meals. Because she's really good at it. She's on notebook number two with meal planning for small groups. And we're going to publish this thing. It's that good. Because we do everything. You know, if you want real easy, you do pizza night. Or you do soup night. Or you do, uh, what's what's another thing we do? Uh, Pasta night. That's another favorite. Or we do grill out night. But we have two favorites, bar none. Two favorites over the years. And one comes in December, and it's meatball night. Don't laugh. Meatball night's awesome. Swedish meatballs on mashed potatoes. You'd come to our life group, guarantee it. The number one favorite, you won't believe this, number one favorite is St. Patrick's Day corned beef and cabbage. We have corned beef and cabbage that everyone looks forward to it. It's just awesome. Now, some of you guys are going, man, I'm hungry. Just wrap this up. I got to go. Besides the food, something happens when we're together. And listen, I don't know how it works. I don't know, except to say that's just the way God designed it. He wants us to get to know one another. There's also another piece that's encouraging to me around this. As we gather in smaller groups, as we gather in worship to accomplish this, look at this verse. I don't want us to just breeze by it. Hebrews 3.13. You must warn each other every day while it's still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and be hardened against God. Here's what I know about my life. I can be deceived by sin. I can be hardened 
in my life toward God. In other words, I can wander away from God. And when your life is hardened to that, you don't even know you've wandered away, right? And so I need people in a worship gathering, studying God's word, eating meals, praying, whatever it is. I need those people to warn me. And here's the deal. Those people that I've met with, that i prayed with, that I've eaten with, you know what? They have earned the right to speak into my life. I'm going to receive that from them. Because I'm going to know all the more that they care for me and love me. And they're going to speak truth into my life so they don't wander away. John, you know what? I, I sent your wander. Oh, really? I didn't even know I was wandering away. And they'll bring me back. That's why we need the habit, Paul says. The habit of getting together. It creates loving community. Okay, there's more. And I love it because it's not just about being together for me and you. All right, as we worship together... All right, we become more excited to be part of God's plans. Look at this, verse 10, 24 again. Let us think of ways to motivate one another of acts and good works. So how many of you would describe yourself as a loving person? Raise your hand. It's okay. Yes. Oh, my hand's down because your hand's up. Raise your hand. I want to see it. All right. That is so awesome. I am not a loving person. But you are. And you know what? When I see you love, it motivates me for me to love. Oh, I can do that. That encourages me. It happened to me when I was in seminary. Right away, Shree and I were just married, and all of a sudden a friend, you know, was getting near Valentine's Day, and he said, oh, hey, they got this warehouse deal on roses. You know, they're only how much money? And I go, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Can you pick some up for me? I'm not that bright. Some of you other guys out there are not that bright. You need to be motivated to love and do good deeds. That's why we get together. So when I see you serving, I want to serve. When we go on our serve Saturdays, I'm amazed. I want to do that. When I watch you minister, watching you minister to kids, oh, hey, I can minister to kids. When you go off on a mission trip and you come back and tell all those stories, it's like, wow, that'd be great. I want to go. Life group, we get together, we go out into the community to help somebody, that's awesome. We minister to one another, someone's hurting or, or feeling bad, and someone pipes up and says, hey, would you like us to bring over meals? I would never think of that. I'm like, hey, we can make a meal, or Shree can make a meal, and we'll bring it over. Right? Someone gets sick, let's help each other. A loved one for somebody in that group passes away, and someone says, hey, let's go to the funeral together. Oh, hey, that'd be a great idea, let's do that. That's why we get together, because each and every one of us is not that bright on ourselves, by ourselves. Each and every one of us is not that loving by ourselves. I've seen this over and over and over again. You can go on and take on the world yourself. You can try to reach a community by yourself. You will burn out. You will get discouraged. Just last, last weekend, our, our youth team, all of our youth team, we brought somebody in. They got a chance to talk to somebody around youth, ministry to youth, and youth vision. And as that person talked and as they interacted, I saw the energy of the room just whoosh, go up. Because they were together. They were talking about it. They were being encouraged. And here's what we fight against, though, in our culture around all this. If we're to accomplish something, if we want something to happen, well, we'll just, uh, just let the experts do it, right? So we drop our kids off to school, and the teacher takes care of it. We want our kids to play a sport, okay, sign up, put them down, drop them off, let, them, let the coach handle it. Music, you want to be in music, you know, we'll let the instructor or dance lessons, and, and we'll let them teach that. And that might work in some of those areas. But we've taken that into the church. Okay, ministry needs to happen. Well, just we'll let the office or the pastors handle that. The leaders handle that. And there's just a, a, an enormous problem around that. First of all, I'm not anywhere near talented to handle all the problems. And like I just told you, I'm not that loving to do it. Secondly, in this room, there are people in some ministries, some of the ministries that are far better off than I am at it. And they can do, they can totally outdo certain ministries better than me. And then lastly, it's, it's simply, just so you know, not biblical. That thought, that kind of thinking. Ephesians 4.11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. God gives to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to do what? To equip God's people to do his work. God's people to build up the church, the body of Christ. In other words, here's the deal. When we worship together, we all get to do the good works. We're all on the field. We're all playing the game. 
and you try to push back, oh, Pastor John, I can't play that position, or I'm not gifted with that. I, I, God hasn't really gifted me. Okay, you can believe that, <laughs> but you have to take that argument up with God, because God says this. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of gifts. Use them well to what? Serve yourself? To serve one another. See, this all happens when we're together. If you have the gift of speaking, then speak as though God himself were speaking with you. If you have the gift of helping others, then do it with the strength and energy that God supplies. Then what happens? As you're serving, as I'm serving, when we're doing this all together, then everything you will do will do what? Bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. What does that sound like? Worship. Worship. You see it? Only, only a few are going to speak up front. Some are going to serve. Others will serve. Then everything will be brought together for the worship and the glory of Jesus. That is why we're better together. We serve better together so we can worship better together. Here's the other thing. If you only see one or two people serving then you only see one or two parts of Jesus. You know that, don't you? It's only one or two parts of Jesus you get to see. When we're all serving, when we're all ministering together, when we're all doing good works together, then we get to see more of Jesus. I, I hope you're catching this today. See, I, I don't know about you, and I, I prayed it this morning. I prayed, God, please, I, I want your presence to be felt. I want in this church for your, God, we don't want to go anywhere without your presence. And I don't know about you. I can always use more encouragement in my life. Can you? All of us can. And I don't know about you. What motivates me to serve Jesus and to love other people for Jesus is you. When I see you do it, that motivates me. Let's pray around it. God, you're, you're really clear, and it's really simple. It's just way better together. And so I pray that on our hearts. Lord, we all have opportunity to get distracted, and we all have opportunity to move away from each other when it comes to worship. I pray, God, that you would bring us together. Help us how that together we see our need for you. Amen. By the way, if you weren't able to be here last week, you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's message. For the Hope family, I just really want to encourage you. Go online and watch that. It really gives some clues to our struggle in this. So I want to encourage you in that. I want to invite the usher.